Section 28 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. All About Coffee by William Euchers. Chapter 20. Cultivation of the Coffee Plant. Part 3. Abyssinia. In the absence of any conclusive evidence to the contrary, the claim that coffee was first made known to modern man by the trees on the mountains of the northern part of the continent of Africa may be accepted without reserve. Undoubtedly the plant grew wild all through tropical Africa, but its value as an addition to man's dietary was brought forth in Abyssinia. Abyssinia, while it may have given coffee to the world, no longer figures as a prime factor in supplying the world, and now exports only a limited quantity. There are produced in the country two coffees known to the trade as Harari and Abyssinian, the former being by far the more important. The Harari is the fruit of the cultivated Arabica trees grown in the province of Harar and mostly in the neighborhood of the city of Harar, capital of the province. The Abyssinian is the fruit of the wild Arabica trees that grow mainly in the province of Sidamo, Kaffa, and Guma. The coffee of Harar is known to the trade as mocha longberry or Abyssinian longberry. Most of the plantations upon which it is raised are owned by the native Hararis, Gala, and Abyssinians, although there are a few Greek, German, and French planters. The trees are planted in rows about 12 or 15 feet apart, and comparatively little attention is given to cultivation. Crops average two a year, and sometimes even five in two years. The big yield is in December, January, and February. The average crop is about 70 pounds, and is mostly from small plots from 50 to 100 trees, there being no very large plantations. All the coffee is brought into the city of Harar, whence it is sent on muleback to Dair Dawa on the Franco-Ethiopian Railway, and from there by rail to Djibouti. Some of it is exported directly from Djibouti, and the rest is forwarded to Aden in Arabia for re-exporting. Abyssinian, or wild coffee, is also known as Kaffa coffee from one of the districts where it grows most abundantly in the state of nature. This coffee has a smaller bean and is less rich in aroma and flavor than the Harari, but the trees grow in such profusion that the possible supply at the minimum of labor in gathering is practically unlimited. It is said that in southwestern Abyssinia there are immense forests of it that have never been encroached upon except at the outskirts, where the natives lazily pick at the beans that have fallen to the ground. It is shelled where it is found, in the most primitive fashion, and goes out in a dirty, mixed condition. Formerly, much of this kaffa coffee was sent to market through Boromida, Harar, and Diridawa. An average annual crop was about 6,000 bags, or 800,000 pounds, of which something more than one-half usually went through Harar. A customs and trading station has lately been established in Gambela, on the Sobat River, and with the development of this outlet, there has been a substantial and increasing exploitation of the wild coffee plants since 1913. Large areas of land have been cleared with a view to cultivation and attention is being given to improved methods of harvesting and of preparing the coffee for the market. At one time, a large amount of coffee went from this region to Addis Abeba on the backs of pack mules, a journey of 35 or 40 days, and then was carried to Djibouti, near 500 miles, part of the way by rail. Now practically all of it goes to Gambela, sent by steamers to Khartoum and by rail to the shipping port at Port Sudan on the Red Sea. Other African Countries Practically every part of Africa seems to be suitable for coffee cultivation, even United South Africa in the southern part of the continent, producing 140,212 pounds in 1918. To name all the countries in which it is grown would be to list nearly all the political divisions of Africa. Among the largest producers are the British East African Protectorate, 18,735,572 pounds in 1918, French Somaliland, 11,222,736 pounds in 1917, Angola, 10,655,934 pounds in 1913, Uganda, 9,999,845 pounds in 1918. Former German East Africa, 
334,450 pounds in 1913, Cape Verde Islands, 1,442,910 pounds in 1916, Madagascar, 707,676 pounds in 1918, Liberia, 761,300 pounds in 1917, Eritrea, 728,840 pounds in 1918, St. Thomas and Prince's Islands, 484,350 pounds in 1916, and the Belgian Congo, 375,000 pounds in 1917. Angola. Coffee is Angola's second product, and there are large areas of wild coffee trees. With a production of nearly 11 million pounds, Angola ranks about third in Africa as a coffee-growing country. The coffee is gathered and sold by the natives, and there are also several European companies engaged in the coffee business. The chief coffee belt extends from the Kwanzaa River northward to the Congo at an altitude of 1,500 to 2,500 feet. In the Kazengo Valley, the wild trees are so thick that thinning out is the only operation necessary to the plantation owner. When the trees become too tall, they are simply cut off about two feet above the ground, and new shoots appear from the trunks in the following season. The largest coffee plantation, owned by the Campania Agricola di Conzengo, produced in 1913 a record year, nearly 1,500 tons. Liberia. Coffee is native to Liberia, growing wild in the hinterland of the Negro Republic, and in the natural state, the trees often attain a height of from 30 to 40 feet. Cultivated Liberian coffee, Coffea liberica, has become a staple of the civilized inhabitants of the country and is grown successfully in hot, moist lowlands or on hills that are not much elevated. On account of the size of the trees, only about 400 can be planted to the acre. In recent years, the native Africans have been planting thousands of trees in the district of Grand Cape Mount. Coffee is grown in all parts of the Republic, but chiefly in Grand Cape Mount and Monserrado. General Outlook in Africa In the African countries, under control of European governments, much recent progress has been made in promoting coffee growing and in improving methods of cultivation. British interests were reported in 1919 as having started a movement toward reviving interest in the coffee growing industry in the British possessions of Africa. The report stated that Uganda, in the East African Protectorate, had 21,000 acres under coffee cultivation, with 16,000 acres more in other parts of the Protectorate and 1,300 acres in Nisaland. Also, that there is no hope of an immediate revival of the industry. In Natal, where it was killed 20 years ago by various pests, quote, but it should certainly be established in the warmer parts of Rhodesia and in the northern part of the Transvaal, an effort is being made to bring this form of enterprise into practical existence, unquote. Coffee-growing possibilities in British East Africa, Kenya colony, are alluring, according to reports from planters in that region. Late in 1920, Major C.G. Ross, a British government official there, said that, quote, British East Africa is going to be one of the leading coffee countries in the world, unquote. Coffee grows wild in many parts of the protectorate, but the natives are too lazy to pick even the wild berries. On the more advanced plantations in all parts of Africa, the approved cultivation methods of other leading countries are carefully followed, special care being given to weeding and pruning. Because of the rank growth of the tropics, on the whole, however, little attention is given to intensive methods. Arabia Whether the coffee tree was first discovered indigenous in the mountains of Abyssinia or in the Yemen district of Arabia will probably always be a matter of contention. Many writers of Europe and Asia in the 15th century, when coffee was first brought to the attention of the people of Europe, agree on Arabia. But there is a good reason to believe the plant was brought to Arabia from Abyssinia in the 6th century. Once all of the coffee of Arabia went to the outside world through the port of Mocha on the eastern coast of the Red Sea. Mocha, which never really raised any coffee, is no longer of commercial importance, but its name has been permanently attached to the coffee of this country. Mocha, mocha, or mocha coffee, i.e. coffea arabica, is raised principally in the Vilayet of Yemen, a district of southeastern Arabia. 
Yemen extends from the north southerly along the line of the Red Sea nearly to the Gulf of Aden. With the exception of a narrow strip of land along the shores of the Red Sea, the Strait of Bab el Manda and the Gulf of Aden, it is a rugged mountainous region in which innumerable small valleys at high elevations are irrigated by waters from the melting snows of the mountains. Coffee can be successfully grown in any part of Yemen, but its cultivation is confined to a few widely scattered districts, and the acreage is not large. The principal coffee regions are in the mountains between Taz and Eib, and between Eib and Yerim, and Yerim and Sana'a, on the caravan route from Taz to Sana'a, between Zabid and Eib, on the route from Taz to Zabid, between Hajula and Menaka on the route from Hodeida to Sana'a, and in the wild mountain ranges, both to the north and south of that route, between Bet al Farik and Obal, and between Manaka and Batham to the north of Bajil. The plant does best at elevations ranging from 3,500 to 6,500 feet. In the Yemen district, coffee is generally grown in small gardens. Large plantations, as they exist in other coffee-growing countries, are not seen in Arabia. Many of these small farms may be parts of a large estate belonging to some rich tribal chief. The native Arabs do not use coffee in the way it is used elsewhere in the world. They drink kishir, a beverage brewed from the husks of the berry and not from the bean. Consequently, the entire crop goes into export. But bad conditions of trade routes, political disturbances, and small regional wars, absence of good cultivation methods, and heavy transit taxes imposed by the government have combined to restrict the production of Yemen coffee. Land for the coffee gardens is selected on hill slopes and is terraced with soil and small walls of stone until it reaches up like an amphitheater, often to a considerable height. The soil is well fertilized. For sowing, the seeds are thoroughly dried in ashes and after being placed in the ground are carefully watched, watered, and shaded. In about a year, the shrub is grown to a height of 12 or more inches. Seedlings in that condition are set out in the garden in rows, about 10 to 13 feet apart. The young trees receive moisture from neighboring wells or from irrigation ditches and are shaded by bananas. At maturity, the trees reach a height of 10 or 15 feet. Since they never lose all their leaves at one time, they appear always green and bear at the same time flowers and fruits, some of which are still green, while others are ripe or approaching maturity. Thus, in some districts, the trees are considered to have two or even three crops a year. All the trees begin to bear about the end of their third year. Cuba Coffee can be grown in practically every island of the West Indies, but owing to the state of civilization in many of the lesser islands, little is produced for international trade, excepting in Jamaica, Guadalupe, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Trinidad, and Tobago. In past years, a considerable quantity of good quality coffee was produced in Cuba, the annual export in the decade of 1840 averaging 50 million pounds. Severe hurricanes, adverse legislation, the rise of coffee growing in Brazil, the increase in cultivation of sugar and other more profitable crops practically eliminated Cuba from the international coffee export trade. Martinique This is a name well known to coffee men the world over as the pioneer coffee growing country of the Western Hemisphere. Gabriel de Clieu introduced the coffee plant to the island in 1723 by bringing it through many hardships from France. For a time, coffee flourished there, but now practically none is grown. Such coffee as bears the name Martinique in modern trade centers is produced in Guadalupe and is only shipped through Martinique. Jamaica Coffee was introduced into Jamaica in 1730, and so highly was it regarded as a desirable addition to the agricultural resources of the island that the British Parliament in 1732 passed a special act providing for the encouraging and fostering of its cultivation. Later, it became one of the great staples of the country. Disastrous floods in 1815 and the gradual exhaustion of the best land since then have brought about a decline in the industry, which is now confined to a few estates in the Blue Mountains and to scattered settler or peasant cultivation in the same districts but at lower altitudes. The tree was formerly grown at all altitudes, from sea level to 5,000 feet, but the best height for it is about 4,500 feet. Four parishes lead in coffee producing. Manchester, with an area of 5,045 acres. St. Thomas, with 2,315 acres. Clarendon, with 2,172 acres. St. Andrew, 
with 1,584 acres. Nine other parishes that raise coffee have less than 1,000 acres under each cultivation. There were 24,865 acres devoted to coffee in 1900. In addition, it was estimated that there were 80,000 acres suitable for cultivation, nearly all being owned by the government. Dominican Republic Coffee was once the leading staple in the Dominican Republic, as in the adjoining Haitian Republic, but in recent years, cacao, sugar, and tobacco have become the predominating crops. Said to have the world's richest and most productive soil, one half of the republic's area is particularly suited to the cultivation of a good grade of coffee of the highland type. But political and industrial conditions have made for neglect of its cultivation by efficient methods. Lack of suitable roads has also militated against the development of the coffee industry. In spite of many drawbacks, it is to be noted that from the beginning of the 20th century, the coffee-growing area has been gradually expanded until exports increased from less than 1 million pounds to 5,029,316 pounds in 1918, although in the next two years there was a recession in total exports to 1,358,825 pounds in 1920. The principal plantations are in the vicinity of the town of Mocha and in the districts of Santiago, Bani, and Bajarona. Generally speaking, the methods of cultivation in the Dominican Republic are somewhat crude as compared with the practice in the larger countries of production in Central America and South America. Guadalupe Guadalupe has an area of 619 square miles, and about one-third of this area is under cultivation. About 15,000 acres are in coffee, giving employment to upward of 10,000 persons. The average yield of a plantation of mature trees is about 535 pounds to the acre. In the early years of the industry in Guadalupe, production and export were considerable. From old records, it appears that in 1784, the exports amounted to 7,500,000 pounds. During the closing years of the 18th century, the annual exports were from 6,500,000 to 8,500,000 pounds, and in the beginning of the next century, they were registered about 6 million pounds. Toward the middle of the 19th century, the growing of sugarcane overtopped that of coffee and profit, and many planters abandoned coffee. After 1884, with the decadence of the sugar industry, coffee was again favored the government giving substantial encouragement by paying bounties ranging from $15 to $19 per acre for all new coffee plantations. In recent years, considerable Liberica and Robusta have planted in place of the exhausted Arabica. Trinidad and Tobago The islands of Trinidad and Tobago are small factors in international coffee trading. Coffee can be grown almost any place on the islands, but its cultivation is confined principally to the districts of Maracas, Aripo, and North Oropuchi. Both the Arabica and Liberica varieties are grown. Honduras Soil, surface, and climate in Honduras, as far as they relate to the cultivation of coffee, are similar to those of the adjoining regions of Central America. The tree grows in the uplands of the interior, thriving best at an altitude from 1,500 to 4,000 feet. Scarcity of labor and insufficient means of transportation have been the chief obstacles in the way of large development of the industry. The departments of Santa Barbara, Copan, Cortez, La Paz, Choloteca, and El Paraiso have the principal plantations. The ports of shipment or Truxillo and Puerto Cortes. Annual production in recent years has been about 5 million pounds. In 1889, the United States imported 3,322,502 pounds, but in 1915, its importations fell away to 665,912 pounds. British Honduras British Honduras has never undertaken to raise coffee on a commercial scale, despite the fact that conditions are not unfavorable to its cultivation. It has failed to produce enough even for domestic consumption, importing most of what it has needed. Annual production, as recorded in recent years, has been upward of 10,000 pounds. Panama Panama presents a very favorable field for growing of coffee. The best district is situated in the uplands of the district of Bugaba, where vast areas of the best lands for coffee growing exist, and where climatic and other conditions are most favorable to its growth. 
No shade is required in this country, and the only cultivation consists of three or four cleanings a year to keep down the weeds, as no plowing, etc., are necessary. Coffee matures from October to January. Water power being abundant, it is used for running all machinery. The annual output of the province of Chiriqui, which produces the bulk of the coffee, is approximately 4,000 sacks of 100 pounds each, all of which is produced in the Boquete district at present, as the coffee planted in the Bugaba section is still young and unproductive. The local supply does not meet the domestic demand, and instead of exporting, a great deal is imported from adjoining countries, although there is a protective tariff of $6 per 100 pounds. The Guianas Coffee has had a precarious existence in the Guianas. Plants are said to have been brought by Dutch voyagers from Amsterdam in 1718 or 1720. They flourished in the new habitat to which they were introduced, and in 1725 were carried from Dutch Guiana to the district of Berbice in British Guiana and into French Guiana. There, the berry was a considerable success for a time, Berbice coffee especially acquiring a good reputation, and when Demerara was settled, coffee became a staple of that region. Shortage of native labor and the difficulty of procuring cheap and capable workers from outside the country ultimately compelled the practical abandonment of the crop in all three sections, Dutch, French, and British. In British Guiana, it is now grown mainly for domestic consumption, and the same is true of French Guiana, which also imports. From the time of its introduction, about 1718, until about 1880, the only coffee grown in Suriname, or Dutch Guiana, was the Cafea Arabica. It was not a bountiful producer, and with labor scarce and unreliable, its cultivation was expensive. Therefore, experiment was made with the Liberica plant. This proved to be very satisfactory, growing luxuriantly, producing abundantly, and requiring minimum labor in care. In 1918, some 16 million pounds were produced. Ecuador Though not of great commercial importance, coffee in Ecuador grows on both the mainland and on the adjacent islands. The area planted to coffee is estimated at 32,000 acres, having an aggregate of about 8 million trees. The trees blossom in December, and the picking season is through April, May, and June. Coffee ranks third in value among the exports of the country. Peru Although possessed of natural coffee land and climate, little has been done to develop the industry in Peru. A finely flavored coffee grows at an altitude of 7,000 feet, while that grown in the lowlands along the Pacific coast is not so desirable. Such small quantities as are grown are cultivated in the mountain districts of Choquisango, Caxamarca, Perine, Huacartambo, Chacuamaya, and Juanas. The Pacific Coast district of Pases Mayo also grows a not unimportant crop. Bolivia Comparatively little attention is given to coffee cultivation in Bolivia. Agricultural methods are crude and are limited to cutting down weeds and undergrowth twice a year. The coffee is planted in small patches or as hedges along the roads or around the fields and other crops. The first crop is picked at the end of one and a half or two years. The trees bear for 15 to 20 years. The average yield is from 3 to 8 pounds per tree. The best grades of coffee are grown at 2,000 to 6,000 feet above sea level. Coffee is cultivated in the departments of La Paz, Cochabamba, Santa Cruz, El Bene, and Chuquisa. In the department of Santa Cruz, there are plantations in the provinces of Sara, Velasco, Chiquitos, and Cordillera. In the Yungas and the Apolobama districts of La Paz, its cultivation reaches the greatest importance, but even there is not of large proportions. Chile, Paraguay, and Argentina. Coffee is of minor, almost insignificant importance in the agriculture of Chile, Paraguay, and Argentina. In Uruguay, the climate is altogether unsuitable for it. Argentina and Paraguay each have small growing districts. In the first named, only the provinces of Salta and Jujuy have, at the latest reports, a little more than 3,000 acres under cultivation. In Paraguay, some householders have grown coffee in their yards solely for their own use. In the Paraguayan district of Altos, north of Asnuncion, a small group of plantations was started before the outbreak of the World War and produced about 300,000 pounds of coffee in a year. Ceylon 
Coffee planting in Ceylon was an important industry for a century until the so-called Ceylon leaf disease attacked the plantations in 1869 and a few years later had practically destroyed all of the trees of the country. Although coffee raising has continued since then, there has been especially since the beginning of the 20th century a steady decline in acreage. There were 4,875 acres under cultivation in 1903. 2,433 acres in 1907, 1,389 in 1912, and 941.5 in 1919. Only 2,200 pounds were produced in 1917. However, the climate and soil of Ceylon seem adapted to coffee culture, and the experimental stations at Paradenia, Anurad Hapura, have been experimenting in recent years with Robusta, Conifora, Ugande, and a Robusta hybrid for the purpose of reviving the industry in the country. Ceylon is one of the oldest coffee-growing countries, the Arabs having experimented with it there, according to legend, long before the Portuguese seized the island in 1505. The Dutch, who gained control in 1658, continued the cultivation, and in 1690 introduced more systematic methods. They sent a few pounds in 1721 to Amsterdam, where the coffee brought a higher price than java or mocha. However, it was not until after the British occupied the island in 1796 that coffee growing was carried on extensively. The first British-owned upland plantation was started in 1825 by Sir Edward Barnes, and for more than 50 years thereafter, coffee was one of the island's leading products. An orgy of speculation and coffee growing in Ceylon, in which five million pounds sterling are said to have been invested, culminated in 1845 in the busting of the coffee bubble, and hundreds were ruined. The peak of the export trade was reached in 1873, when 111,495,216 pounds of coffee were sent out of the country. Even then, the plantations were suffering severely from the leaf disease, which had appeared in 1869, and by 1887, the coffee tree had practically disappeared from Ceylon. Ceylon's day in the coffee was a cycle of 50-odd years. French Indochina Coffee culture in French Indochina is a comparatively small factor in international trade, although production is on the increase, particularly from those plantations planted to Robusta, Liberica, and Excelsa varieties. The average annual export for the five-year period ended with 1918 was 516,978 pounds, nearly all of it going to France. The first experiments with coffee growing were begun in 1887 near Hanoi and Tonkin. The seeds were the Arabica variety brought from Réunion, and the production of the first years was distributed throughout the country to foster the industry. Eventually, Arabica was found unsuitable to the soil and climate, and experiments were begun with Robusta and other hardier types. A survey of the industry of the country in 1916 showed that the plant was being successfully grown in the provinces of Tonkin, Annam, and Cochin, China, and that altogether there were about one million trees in bearing. The plantations are mostly in the foothills of the mountain ranges or on the slopes, although a few are located near the coastline at 1,000 feet or even less above sea level. The larger and more successful plantations follow advanced methods of planting and cultivating, while the government maintains experimental stations for the purpose of fostering the industry. It is believed that French Indochina in coming years will assume an important position in the coffee trade of the world, particularly as a source of supply for France. Federated Malay States, including Straits, Settlements Rubber has been the chief cause of the decline of the coffee industry in the Federated Malay States. Since the closing years of the 19th century, coffee has been steadily on the downward path in acreage and production, with possible exceptions of parts of straight settlements, which in 1918 exported mostly to England some 3,500,000 pounds of good-grade coffee. The other sections of the Federation shipped less than 1 million pounds. In the early days, planters of the Malay Peninsula knew little about proper methods of cultivating and depended mostly upon what they learned of the practices in Ceylon, which, unfortunately for them, were not at all suited to the Malay country. They secured their best crops from lowlands where peaty soil prevailed and eventually all the coffee grown in the peninsula came from such regions. 
Liberica is mostly favored and is still grown with some success as an intercrop with coconuts and rubber. The Robusta variety has also been introduced, but does not seem to do as well as Liberica. Between 23 and 2,600 acres, according to recent returns, have been under coffee as a catch crop with coconuts out of a total of 40,000 acres in coconut estates. One planter has been reported as making quite a success with this method of intercropping for coffee, but it is not generally approved. There has been a general decline in acreage, product, and exports since the closing years of the 19th century. Until now, the industry is regarded as practically at a standstill, and likely so to remain as long as all rubber shall continue to hold the commercially high position to which it has attained. Unsatisfactory prices realized for the crop, poor growth of the trees in some localities, and the gradual weakening of the trees under rubber as they mature are offered as the principal explanations of this decrease in acreage. Nearly all the Malay crop in recent years has been grown in Selangor, though Negri Sembilian, Pahang, and Parak continue as factors in the trade. Australia Although Australia is a prospective coffee-growing country of large natural possibilities, the Australian Yearbook for 1921 states that Queensland is the one state in which experiments have been tried, and that in 1919-1920 there were only 24 acres under cultivation. Queensland soils are of volcanic origin, exceptionally rich, and support trees that are vigorous and prolific with a bean of fine quality. The Arabica is chiefly cultivated, and the trees can be successfully grown on the plains at sea level as well as up to a height of 1,500 or 2,000 feet. The trees mature earlier than in some other countries. Planted in January, they frequently blossom in December of the next year or a month later and yield a small crop in July or August, that is, in about two years and a half from the time of planting. The bean closely resembles the choice Blue Mountain coffee of Jamaica. For coffee cultivation, the labor cost is almost prohibitive. As much as 1,500 weight of beans per acre have been gathered from trees in North Queensland, and for years the average was 1,000 weight per acre. After 30 years of cultivation, no signs of disease have appeared. At late as 1920, the government was proposing to make advances of 14 cents a pound upon coffee in the parchment to encourage the development of the industry to a point where it would be possible for local coffee growers to capture at least the bulk of the Commonwealth's import coffee trade of 2,605,240 pounds. Coffee grows well in most all the islands of the Pacific Ocean, and in some of them, as in the Philippines and Hawaii, the industry in past years reached considerable importance. Hawaii Coffee has been grown in Hawaii since 1825 from plants brought from Brazil. It has also been said that the seed was brought by Vancouver, the British navigator, on his Pacific exploration voyage, 1791 through 94. Not, however, until 1845 was an official record made of the crop, which was then 248 pounds. The first plantations, started on the low levels near the sea, did not do well, and it was not until the trees were planted at elevations of from 1,000 to 3,000 feet above sea level that the better returns were obtained. Coffee is grown on all the islands of the group, but nowhere to any great extent except on Hawaii, which produces 95% of the entire crop. Next in importance, though far behind, is the island of Oahu. On Hawaii, there are four principal coffee districts, Kona, Hanakua, Puna, and Ola. About four-fifths of the total output of the islands is produced in Kona. At one time, there were considerable coffee areas in Maui and Kauai, but sugarcane eventually there took the place of coffee. The Kona Coffee District extends for many miles along the western slope of the island of Hawaii and around the famous Kealake Kua Bay. The soil is volcanic and even rocky, but coffee trees flourish surprisingly well among the rocks and are said to bear a bean of superior quality. Coffee trees in Kona are planted principally in the open, though sometimes they are shaded by the native kukui trees. They are grown from seed in nurseries, and the seedlings, when one year old, are transplanted in regular lines nine feet apart. In two years, a small crop is gathered, yielding from five to twelve bags of cleaned coffee per acre. At three years of age, the trees produce from eight to twenty bags of cleaned coffee per acre, and from that time they are fully matured. The ripening season is between September and January, and there are two principal pickings. Many of the trees are classed as wild, that is, they are not topped, and are cultivated in an irregular manner and are poorly cared for, but they yield 700 to 800 pounds per acre. 
The fruit ripens very uniformly and is picked easily and at slight expense. It is calculated that in the Hawaiian group, more than 250,000 acres of good coffee land are available and about 200,000 acres more of fair quality. Comparatively little of this possible acreage has been put to use. According to the census of 1889, there were then 6,451 acres devoted to coffee, having young and old, 3,225,743 bearing trees. The yield in that census year was 2,297,000 pounds, of which 2,112,650 pounds were credited to Hawaii, the small remainder coming from Maui, Oahu, Kauai, and Molokai. A blight in 1855-56 set back the industry, many plantations being ruined and then given over to sugarcane. After the blight had disappeared, the plantations were reestablished, and prosperity continued for years. Following the American occupation of the islands in 1898 came another period of depression. With the loss of the protective tariff that had existed, prices fell to an unremunerative figure, and the more profitable sugarcane was taken up again. After 1912, the increased demand for coffee, with higher prices, led again to hopes for the future of the industry. Planting was encouraged, and it has been demonstrated that from lands well-selected and intelligently cultivated, it is possible to have a yield of from 1,200 to 2,100 pounds per acre. Improvements have also been made in pulping and milling facilities. Many of the plantations are cultivated by Japanese labor. Exports of coffee from Hawaii to the principal countries of the world in 1920 were 2,573,300 Philippine Islands. Spanish missionaries from Mexico are said to have carried the coffee plant to the Philippine Islands in the latter part of the 18th century. At first, it was cultivated in the province of La Laguna, but afterward other provinces, notably Batangas and Cavite, took it up, and in short time the industry was one of the most important in the islands. The coffee was of the Arabica variety. In the middle of the 18th century, and after the industry had a position of importance, several provinces produced profitable crops that contributed much to the wealth of the communities where the berry was cultivated. In those days, the city of Yiba was an important trading center. In the period of its prime, Philippine coffee enjoyed fine repute, especially in Spain, Great Britain, and China at Hong Kong, those three countries being the largest consumers. At one time, in 1883 and 1884, the annual export was 16 million pounds, which demonstrates the importance of the industry at the peak of its prosperity. The leaf blight appeared on the island about 1889, causing destruction from which there has not yet been complete recovery. The export of 3,086 pounds in 1917 shows the depths into which the industry had fallen. The Bureau of Agriculture at Manila announced in 1915 that an effort was to be made to rehabilitate the coffee industry of the islands. Nothing came of the effort, which died a borning. Since then, several attempts to introduce disease-resisting varieties of coffee from Java have failed because of lack of interest on part of the natives. Despite the misfortunes that have overwhelmed it in the past and are now retarding its growth, it is still believed that the industry in these islands may be rehabilitated. Conditions of soil and climate are favorable. Land and labor are cheap, abundant, and dependable. Railroads run into the best coffee regions, and good cart roads are in process of construction. Some plantations of consequence are still in existence, and serious consideration is being given to their development and to increasing their number. Guam Coffee is one of the commonest wild plants on the little island of Guam. It grows around the houses like shade trees or flowering shrubs, and nearly every family cultivates a small patch. Climate and soil are favorable to it, and it flourishes with abundant crops from the sea level to the tops of the highest hills. The plants are set in straight rows from three and a half to seven feet apart, and are shaded by banana trees or by coconut leaves stuck in the ground. There is no production for export, scarcely enough for home consumption. Other Pacific Islands other islands of the Pacific do not loom large in coffee growing, though New Caledonia gives promise as a producer, exporting 1,248,024 pounds in 1916, most of which was Robusta. Tahiti produces a fair coffee, but in no commercial quantity. In the Samoan group, there are plantations, small in number, in size, and in amount of production. 
Several islands of the Fiji group are said to be well adapted to coffee, but little is grown there and none for export. End of section 28. Read by Trish Rutter, San Diego, February 15, 2022.